Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in tonight. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan, Miami Book Fair, and all of us at Books and Books, I welcome you to a virtual evening with Lynn Enger and Thomas Maltman to discuss their new novels. Lynn Enger is the author of American Gospel, an intimate drama at the heart of an apocalyptic vision. Lynn has published two previous novels, Undiscovered Country and The High Divide, a finalist for awards from the Midwest Booksellers Association. His stories have been published in literary journals such as Glimmer Train, Ascent, and American Fiction. A graduate of the Iowa Writers' Workshop, he has received a James Missioner Award, a Minnesota State Arts Board Fellowship, and a Jerome Travel Grant. He teaches English at Minnesota State University, Moorhead. Thomas Maltman is the author of The Land, a story of violence at the heart of a pastoral landscape. Thomas has an MFA from Minnesota State University, Mankato. His first novel, The Nightbirds, won an Alex Award, a Spur Award, and the Friends of American Writers Library Award. His second novel, Little Wolves, was an Indie Next pick and an all Iowa Read selection. He teaches at Normandale Community College and lives in the Twin Cities area. I'll remind you that all of you watching today can order your copy of American Gospel and The Land from Books and Books Below by pressing the green button at the bottom of the screen. Every purchase you make keeps Books and Books up and running. So we thank you and we remind you that indie bookstores need your help now more than ever and that these two books make great Christmas holiday gifts. Um, we'll have time for a Q&A with the audience following the talk so please go ahead and post your questions anytime during the broadcast in the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen, and we'll get to those right after the talk. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the stage. Hi, Lynn. Hi, Christina. Hello, Tom. Hi, Christina. Hi, Lynn. Hey, Tom. So, uh, first of all, thank you to Books and Books, um, to Christina for, for putting this together. Um, thank you to Mitchell Kaplan uh, and, and everyone else involved in the, in the wonderful um, store there in Coral Gables in Miami. It's a, it's a real pleasure uh, to be here. And also, I'm, I'm Lynn and, 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 and Tom is here. Um, uh, Tom, do you, do you, uh, do you want to start by talking about your great novel, The Land? I, First, want to say how much I like the land. Uh, I read it earlier this fall, and um, it's a tremendous and timely book. And I and I highly recommend that everybody get a copy and read it as soon as you can. Well, thank you, Lynn, and um, a, a thank you to Books and Books and to Christina and, and Mitchell. It's it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you for all of you for joining us tonight um, as well. And I, I also really have to recommend American Gospels is a wonderful novel, one of the best that I've read um, all year long. And so it might sound strange to you to be recommending to you after what a hard year uh, 2020 is, has been to be recommending two books that deal with the end of the world. Um, but I, I really do think that, that, that when we read about troubled periods in American history and the 1974 um, fall of Nixon that's featured in Lynn's novel, American Gospel, and my novel takes place in 1999, right before Y2K, again, another time of fear when people thought that the world might end. And I think that there's something hopeful about reading novels that show Americans going through troubled times and getting through it. Um, and so for that reason, I do think that these are ultimately hopeful books. Um, and my, my novel in particular is about a troubled young man. Um, he is a college student. He's uh, down on his luck. He's been in a terrible car accident. Um, and he uh, has come, become the caretaker of a place out in the country. Um, he's isolated out there in the woods alone. Um, he suspects that a woman he was involved with who has gone missing, um, he suspects that the, the people that were part of this white supremacist church that's also out there in the country had something to do with her disappearance. And so really the, the land is, is the story about his journey, 
into this this wilderness place what happens when he meets these people and his search for for really trying to find out the truth about what happened to this woman and so that's the basics of what the story is about how about american gospel um uh, tell us about uh, your, your book lynn and, and uh what inspired you to write it as well too yeah my novel takes place as tom suggested in 1974 uh, in particular it takes place in the month of august of 1974 and uh, that was the month that Richard Nixon resigned the presidency. Um, so that's the backdrop of, of the novel. Um, in the foreground, um, in northern Minnesota, there's an old man who's a uh, farmer uh, slash preacher slash um, self-appointed prophet who has a, a near-death experience. And in this, as, as, he, as he lies between this life and the, and the next, he has a vision. Um, and when he is revived, um, comes back to this world. He believes that God has told him in that vision the precise date of the rapture, um, which is just 14 days away on August 19th, 1974. And so the novel, that happens right away. I'm not giving anything away. That The novel is a countdown of those 14 days. Um, the, the characters, the main characters in the novel are the old man, his son, who is a, a writer uh, in New York City, um, and thinks his dad is a lunatic. Um, and then uh, a, a young woman who is an actress in Hollywood. Um, she's about 30 years old. She happened to grow up um, next door to the, uh, the old man um, uh, in Minnesota uh, on a hog farm next to his farm. And so when she hears, when she's in LA, Palm Springs, when she hears about this, uh, this um, prediction from her old, old friend, um, she takes note and um, she wants to believe it's true. And she comes back to Minnesota. Um, and when she joins him on his, in his, on his, uh, in his little commune in, in Minnesota, the, the media, it, of course, is aware of this. And, um, and the world uh, descends on this, uh, this lake in northern Minnesota, which becomes ground zero for, for the rapture, for the end of the world. So, that's the premise for the story. That's the setup for it. Um, it's a it's a book about faith. Um, it's a book about um, you know belief. Um, I think uh, I think too. It's a book um, about how people who have a desire for easy, simple answers can be badly manipulated and misled. Um, so in that regard. It seems to me a very timely book. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that that's that's the that's the basic story. Uh, I I actually wrote a draft of this book. Um, I don't know if I told you this earlier, Tom, but I, I wrote a draft of this book in about nineteen. I started it when I was um, in graduate school, and and I and I finished it about the time my kids were getting born. So it was late eighties, early nineties when I when I wrote a draft of this book. It wasn't a very good book. I mean, it was wandering. I didn't quite know what I wanted to do with it, but the characters were there, at least two of them. And I, and when I finished it, um, I realized how uh, that it wasn't working. I put it away. I put it in a trunk, literally, and I and I didn't look at it for 25 years. I I pulled that book out again a few years ago, um, in about 2015. Um, and about that time, I realized that I had an idea for how I could put some legs under this book and give it, give it some tension and shape. And um, so I came up with this plot of the, of the, of the rapture being imminent. Um, and, and I think that idea came to me more or less one day when I was going to a graduation ceremony <clears throat> on the campus where I teach. And it was this beautiful spring day. And I was walking across campus to the field house where the graduation is, is held. And there was a bus there. This was in 2011. <clears throat> there was a bus there, big, big bus, with um, plastered with signs. And there was a person in the bus with a megaphone shouting at us as we streamed into the field house, be ready, the end is coming on May 21st. And that's what the signage on the bus said. It said, be, be prepared, Christ is returning on May 21st, 2011. And, and this, this bus had been sent there are a lot of them sent across the country from this ministry in California. 
<clears throat> and he, the person who had come up with this date um, was well financed. People from across the country sold their homes, joined him in California, helped him promote and broadcast this this um, rapture date. Um, and they showed up in our town, and um, so that I think helped me sort of it triggered something in me, and I and I realized that the people that I'd invented for this earlier novel um, would be the people who would <laughs> believe this uh, or not believe it, but, but it would animate that novel in a way that I hadn't been able to, to, to do. Um, and so that, that's kind of the, 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 the backstory on, on my, my book. And Tom, I know that you have some, some own personal history when it comes to, uh, to your book as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I, I just hearing you talk, you know, just a, a reminder to me that nothing's ever lost. As writers, we, we talk about how every writer has a novel or two that's down in the basement you know, collecting dust somewhere, but nothing's ever lost. And, and sometimes you can go back and rediscover a story. And it's, it's just beautiful that that happened for you with um, American Gospel. Um, there, were, there were three forces that really fed into the making of the land. Um, number one, in the, the mid-1990s, I did um, become the caretaker for this property over um, the course of one winter. And it was one of the loneliest winters of my life. Um, uh, this place was out in the country. Um, this, this couple was, uh, they were snowboarding down to um, the South Padre Islands in, in Texas. And so I took care of their property and I just remember the coyotes would come at night um, and it was really an isolated place. And I was haunted by that winter. It really haunted my imagination. And when I became caretaker for the property, they gave me one strict instruction. They said, make sure nothing happens to our dog. And so over the course of that winter, I did all that I could um, to try and keep this dog alive. And um, to tell just one brief a shaggy dog story, uh, You've heard this one before, Lynn, but I've, I've got to tell it. Um, so there was like one uh, time where I went away on business to Seattle and I asked a friend to care for this dog while I was going to be gone on business. I was gone for three days. Temperature dropped to 25 below zero um, while I was gone. And I, when I got back, I could see that there were no tire tracks in the snow. And so I knew that this friend had actually never been out to feed and take care of the dog. It, it had been out in 25 below zero temperatures um, for the, the entire three days and three nights. Um, so I, I thought pretty sure that this old dog was dead. And so I went in and uh, called for it. It didn't respond, crawled into the kennel with it. And I could see that it's, it's fur, it was just uh, faintly rising and falling. And I crawled in there and I hugged that dog and held it until he started breathing and moving again. And so I did everything that I could to keep that, that dog alive um, over the course of one winter. And um, when the couple came back in the spring, they decided that the dog was too old and they put it to sleep. Um, and so it's kind of a, a, a sad ending to a story. It's not much of a story really, um, but sometimes what happens I think for novelists is you realize how different things can come together. And so there was something else that had also troubled and haunted me. Um, my family in the mid 1980s um, bought property in Northern California. And this property was partly meant to be a vacation spot my grandparents named it the land. Um, all of their, their six children invested in the purchase of this property that was out in the wilderness. And, um, and it was meant as a vacation spot, but also my grandparents had read uh, Hal Lindsay's The Late Great Planet Earth. Um, that's family legend says that, that that's part of what inspired them to do this. And so they really did believe that end times might be upon us. And so this property in Northern California um, was also meant as a place of refuge. If things went, turned bad, if things went south, um, this, this would be the place where the family could hold up. And in 1999, I do remember that, um, that there were some relatives who, again, looked to this place, the land, um, as a place of refuge. And they went there um, right before Y2K hit, just in case, you know, things went wrong. And so I, I was thinking about the land. I was thinking about the fears that people have and um, the fears that guide people. I was thinking about how how often Americans um, turn to the wilderness as a place of escape um, and how it, it, it is part of our American psyche and, and, and imagination. So I, I grew up, I grew up hearing my, my, grand, my grandma reading to me from the book of Revelation. Um, 
and grew up in a family that did have some fundamentalist beliefs. Grew up hearing about uncles talking about knowing people who could blow the last bridge heading into Scotts Valley. Um, and so, you know, I was thinking about all of those stories, you know, and, and thinking about um, the end of the world and, and Y2K. And um, so that was one other element that I wanted to explore with the novel. And then the third and final element that really kind of came together is um, at the time that I was taking care of that property, I lived in the inland Northwest. And um, the Randy Weaver uh, cabin had just been raided um, in the mid 1990s. Um, it was an 11 day siege, three people died. Um, and that raid left enduring scars on the region. And so I, I really wanted to think about or look at white supremacy and how that white supremacy is, is one of the most troubling issues that we deal with as a country. Um, and that sometimes we have to deal with in our own lives as well. How do we respond to racism? Um, and so I, I knew I wanted to explore that theme. And the novel moved to the Midwest because as I started doing research, then more and more, all of the signs kept pointing me back to the Midwest. Um, Randy and Vicki Weaver were born and raised and radicalized right in small town Iowa. Um, the Aryan uh, bank robbers uh, were from raiding banks in the Midwest. You had the Posse Comitatus up by Moorhead in North Dakota right there. And so all signs kept pointing me back toward the Midwest. I knew I had to bring this novel home um, because we want to believe that white supremacy happened someplace else, someplace way in the deep south or um, you know, but but really, it's all around us, and and we have to learn how to respond or answer to it. So those were the three forces that really kind of came together and um, inspired the the writing um, of the book. One one thing I just listening to you talk, <clears throat> Tom, and I've heard that story about you, and that the dog that that you had to keep alive. But I what I love about that story and what I always remember about it is, um, in relation to the novel that you've written is is your climbing into the dog's um, kennel or, or house and, and literally warming that dog up. I mean, it's 25 below zero outside. What it, a couple of things that that triggers in me and, and, and it has to do with the compassion in this book you've written. There's so much compassion for, for really all, all the characters. Um, and, and in addition to that, such a deep and organic connection to the natural world. Um, and that to me, when I'm reading a book, um, I always, I, th I think the great pleasure for me is to be transported to another place. Um, and, and if a book is set in, in, uh, a place that has a, a, a richness of, of the, of the natural world, like Northern Minnesota, um, then I want to be transported to that place. And, and your book does that brilliantly. Um, and it, and it tells me that you have that kind of connection to, to the outdoors, to the climate, to the, to the place. And, um, that, that just shines throughout your novel. Um, and of course it's called the land. One would sort of expect that. And, and when I picked it up for the first time, I was, I was hoping for that experience, which I, which I did receive. Um, so anyway, that's just my thoughts. And when I I'm listening to you talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I, I feel the same uh, thing about, um, you know, your characters too, um, right down to the pastor. It'd be so easy, um, this pastor Enoch, um, who's this at the center of your novel, you know, in some ways he's an egoist, um, you know, he has, he has his various issues, but you feel for him, you feel compassion for this really deeply flawed human. And I loved that relationship that he has with that Unitarian um, that's in the story and how she kind of inspires him and brings out some of his more human um, task as well. Um, and so I, I think, you know, I, the same thing I felt reading your work too. And, and you know, speaking of the, the natural world, I, I thought, um, you know, there, there are motifs in your novel too. Um, the farm at uh, Battle Lake, is it Battle Axe or Battle Lake? Um, and ba battle, battle Point in Battle Point, yeah. Battle Point. And, and also the the mountain lion, the mountain mm -hmm. lion to me, um, that's, that is fresh and vivid. It's been a couple months since I've read it, but I can still remember the different scenes with the mountain lion in it. And I wondered if you might talk a little bit about that mountain lion and how it became part of the story. Yeah, it, it, uh, it's interesting that you mentioned that because when, earlier I said that the book was, um, had been written, um, a long time ago, the first draft of that book was written in the early nineties. 
Um, and that book got completely scrapped when I started American Gospel. I started over with the similar characters. The one scene, maybe two, but one scene survived from that early draft, and that was the mountain lion scene, the first mountain lion scene. There, there's a moment in the, in the novel where the where the fundamentalist preacher father um, <clears throat> and, and his son, uh, they have a farm and some stock is, is killed by the mountain lion, and and they, uh, the father says, you know, we're going to we're going to go out tonight into the shed where the mountain lion killed the, the animals, and <clears throat> and we're we're gonna we're gonna wait for it to return, and you're going to shoot this lion, um, and that's in fact what happens. But it's a very frightening moment for the for the son, very frightening. Um, for the father, it's a symbolic moment. He believes that he is, the, the mountain lion in his mind is this representation of evil. Um, and maybe Satan, and um, that he wants the son to encounter that um, and come to understand through such an encounter that sin and the devil is a real thing, and he has to confront it and fight it and kill it um, for himself. And so, so for the old man, that, that's a powerful moment. For the young man, it's, it's a moment where he feels like his father um, is more interested in in his ideology and his in his beliefs, in his belief system, than he is in his own son, because he puts the son at some physical peril. So it is a powerful moment in the novel. Um, it is a moment of great uh, tension, um, and and it, it highlights the fraught relationship between the father and and the, and the son, and it kind of carries through in their memories and through other encounters throughout the throughout the story. Um, and and <laughs> we've talked before, Tom, uh, about 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 your book and and the natural world, and and you have early ra ra rather early in it this scene that's astounding. I mean, when I read it, it, it felt like I was on the one hand experiencing it, and on the other hand experiencing a kind of dream reality. Um, and it's a moment when when uh, your your main character uh, Lucian. Um, sees this strange occurrence in nature involving a flock of ravens. I can't remember what ravens are called, a murder of ravens. No, nah, that's crows. But it's an, a, unkind, a, an unkindness an, of ravens. That's right. They're called that's an right. unkindness. <laughs> in fact, you have a, cha a chapter title with that, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> in, anyway, anyway um, that, that was just, uh, I mean, that was, again, uh, probably for me the most memorable moment in the novel, but a key moment. That, that is revisited um, as the novel unfolds. Do you, you want to mention anything about it? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm glad glad you, you brought that up. And, and you know, it is something that I knew I wanted to work with from the very beginning. Uh, many years ago, I'd read about uh, these wildlife researchers um, who had been up in this remote island in Alaska. And as, as they're watching, the pines around them just fill with ravens. So many ravens that the branches are bending and snapping. And um, to their horror and their astonishment, these ravens begin attacking each other. And there's this giant battle in the sky between these various ravens. Uh, they're, they're dropping to the ground and, and they, the researchers don't even know. Nobody's ever seen anything like this. Um, later, the wolves come and pick up the fallen ravens. And, and it was just such a, a vivid scene. And I knew that I had this troubled young man who's been in this accident. You're not really sure that what he's seen is real or not real because, uh, you know, he suffered um, such severe um, damage in, during the accident. And um, I knew I wanted to work with this, the scene of, of, you know, that this is nature. This is what nature can do. Um, it kind of echoed with some of the themes that I wanted to explore with the novel um, involving alienation, involving violence. Um, and uh, so I, I knew I wanted to work with that, and it just kind of organically or naturally fit um, with the story about this young man out in the woods, um, uncertain if what he's seen around him is really and, and truly happening. Yeah, yeah. Say, um, Tom, I'm I'm watching the um, the the, uh, the clock, and also the, there's a we can see if there's any questions. And I was thinking, I, I'm wondering, do you think we should um, each read a very short passage? from our books. Um, and then maybe while we do that, there might be some people might have a chance to um, ask a question or two. If not, that's fine too. But do you think that's a good idea? I think that sounds great. Um, okay. Why don't, why don't 
You go first. You you can lead us off, Len. Sure. Um, okay, I'll do that. Um, I think what I'll do um, is just read the first page or so, so of of my of my novel. Um, that way, I don't have to set anything up. Um, the the novel, as I mentioned, is a kind of countdown. So every chapter is is simply titled the the, the day um, that it takes place. So first chapter is August sixth. Uh, Tuesday, 1974. Turn, if you will, back to 1974 and the cathartic end of that long summer, a pivot in time that re requires only the smallest adjustment. Now rise to an altitude that offers a view of the whole continent, the entire span of desert, mountain, lake, fruited field, towered city, ocean shore, from this height, look down and pick them out, these ordinary, remarkable people, three of them, flesh of your flesh, a man, a woman, another man. Bring them into focus, squint if you need to. There on a small farm beside a lavender blue lake in the center of the northern forest, the first man is getting dressed in his upstairs room. Worn denim shirt, lace up boots, awake before the sun as always, tall and straight, and bone thin, white hair unshorn, he is simple in appearance only, this self-appointed prophet. Watch him as he descends the narrow staircase of his turn of the century farmhouse, anticipating his coffee, unaware that he is just minutes away from dying. The woman way off in the California desert is still young, barely 30, asleep this morning in her waterbed, palm trees outside her window, three hours, from waking to the life she once believed was charmed and which still might be. She's lovely, an actress with hair like the August wheat of the great Midwest. Her face is one that absorbs desire and sends back love. Not long ago, she was a child in the hands of goddess makers, celebrated and pampered, lusted after. Was she happy? She might have believed so, but now she feels only pain, the kind that calls for routine numbing. And finally, to the other coast in its city of high towers, New York, where the other man, son of the prophet, has stayed up all night, writing, talking, and drinking. He often jogs the seven blocks west from the all-night tavern that he favors to his third floor walk up in the village, anxious to spend a little time in bed with his girlfriend before she leaves for work. This morning though, he is in no hurry and he even stops to sit on a bench in Washington Square, have a smoke. The sun is just up, light coming in from that low angle that scrubs the world, making everything look cleaner than it is. The sooty bricks, the street, the yellow cabs. And he thinks of the 20,000 indigent souls that lie beneath his feet buried here when this place was a potter's field. He can't help an irrational stitch of guilt for the good fortune about to befall him. But I've earned it, he thinks. <laughs> like his father, like the actress, like all of us, he is unable to see the disappointments and reversals and confounding victories to come. He knows only what he knows, which is far less than he imagines. <laughs> So that's an introduction to the to the three main characters. Um, I'll stop there. Love it. I love that you pulled off omniscient narration, though. That is just <laughs> so hard to do. Um, and you managed to pull it off so great in the, in the beginning there. Only for um, a page and a half, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> it's well done. Uh -uh. So I, I'm going to read um, just a really brief scene. Um, and this is a scene uh, where something happened that kind of uh, surprised me. Um, uh, it's a scene where the doorbell rings in the story, and I, I'm just going to uh, bring it. So he's he's alone in this house, um, way out there, isolated. I, you know, the the fact that this doorbell is ringing um, takes him by surprise. So this is the moment that I wasn't expecting um, as a writer. I was just getting into The Exorcist when the doorbell rang. The sound jarred me from the dark dream of the movie. Who could possibly be here? This house was in the middle of nowhere. I paused the movie and climbed the spiral staircase. I opened the door to reveal a skinny girl who appeared to be about my age and was dressed in a pea green army coat 
a duffel bag slung over her shoulder. Her dark hair was chopped short, her features sharp and hawkish, her, br her eyes brown and almond-shaped. Her coat appeared too thin for the weather, her face pale as the clouds dropping snow behind her. She tilted her head, bird-like, as if I was the mystery here. Who are you? Me? Lucian. I'm looking after this place for the Krolls. Lucian. She frowned as if she disapproved of the name. I considered explaining how I'd been named after a cherished grandfather, but truthfully, I'd never cared for my name either. The girl peered past me into the foyer, as if looking for someone. Where are my parents? Uh, parents? Neither Kroll had mentioned any daughter. Rambling through the house, I'd seen no pictures of this girl, no toys or dolls or any sort of evidence that any child had ever lived here. She hugged herself with her arms and let out an exasperated sigh. Her lips had a bluish cast from the cold. Listen, I don't know who you are. Her tongue darted out to touch her lips and her eyes locked on mine as if she'd made some vital determination. Without another word, she pushed past me, tracking snow indoors. I snagged her by the elbow. Hey, I didn't say you could come in. The girl looked thin and bony, but she shook out of my grip, dropped her duffel, and jabbed one finger right in the center of my chest. She smelled like she hadn't bathed in a month, a musky animal odor overwhelming in tight quarters. What have you done with my mom and dad? She said, advancing on me until she had me backed against the wall. They're in Texas, I told her, still not sure what to believe. I squeezed past her to the open door, taking one fresh gulp of cold air before shutting it and turning back to her. South Padre Island, at least until March or April. I'm caring for the house and the dog while they're gone. Kaiser, she said, her nose twitching, and they're gone all winter. She made it sound like they'd never done it before. They couldn't wait to escape the cold. She quirked one thin eyebrow as if she knew there was more to it than that. I hadn't mentioned any of the Y2K talk. I considered it vaguely reassuring that she knew the name of the dog. They'll be back when the snow melts, I continued. If the world doesn't end on December 31st, I didn't add. And you're in contact with them? I massaged my, my sore hip, which ached from the cold the girl had brought into the room with her. I have their number in case something goes wrong, such as a stranger forcing her way into the house. Are you hurt? It's nothing. So you're their daughter. You think they would have mentioned something like that? She spread her out her hands, palms up. Why would they? We've been estranged. She lingered on that word, her small, sharp face tightening at some unpleasant memory. They wouldn't expect me to come home for the holidays. There aren't any pictures of you anywhere, I said. Not a single room or any girlish trace, like a stuffed bear or pink quilt. But then again, she didn't seem the girlish type. Thanksgiving was little more than a week away. How long was she planning to stay? I resented this intrusion on my peace. We aren't on, my, on speaking terms. My dad wiped his hands at me. She made a gesture, a flat slapping sound as her palms came together. I could picture Mr. Kroll doing the same. I'll call them, I said. They'll want to know you're here. She shook her head, her brown eyes huge and pleading. Don't, she said. So uh, that's the scene where Arwen um, enters the story and... Uh, once she comes in that door, I, I just knew as a writer, I wasn't going to be able to get her back out again. She was there to stay. Um, and she becomes one of my favorite characters. Um, I won't say too much more about her. Um, you know, at, she is the mysterious guest because we're not certain what to believe about her um, when she first makes her appearance. Um, uh, but that was kind of one of the happy discoveries that happened I, as I was writing or, or telling um, the story itself. And there's that there's that mention in that scene of the world potentially ending on December 31st, um, 1999. Um, you know, uh, both of our novels have to do with, uh, you know, the potentiality of a, an apocalypse, a, a moment that is an end stop to to life as we as we're experiencing it. Um, and, and we wrote the novels, you know, before the pandemic, um, before the kinds of um, uh, before the, the the fractiousness of the last several months uh, uh, politically, I, I'm just wondering, Tom, if if you've had um, what what you think about that. I mean, what what's it been like for you um, going into this this publication experience with a novel about about you know apocalypse, and and we're living through what feels has felt at times like. <laughs> 
like a, a, an apocalyptic time or moment uh, in, in our history. Um, there's been a lot written in the last year that has come to my attention because I'm my antenna are so far out there, but um, in the Times and, and other publications about about how, you know, some some of the religious community, but people in general are, are looking at this at this time and being newly um, sensitized to the notion of society, the world coming to to an end point. And, and what's it been like for you? What have you noticed or do you have any observations about it? You know, I, I, what I would say is that I, I've always absorbed this idea from um, another writer I know named Dean Bakopoulos. And um, he said something that, that's kind of stuck with me over the years, that what a story should do is take darkness and bring it into light. And so there are some dark themes that I, I think both our, our works explore. Um, but these are also themes that we are struggling with right now as a country. Um, what do we do with alienated young men? Um, what happens when a, a person gets seduced into a belief system that ultimately has some elements of hate um, that go with it? How do we how do we get people back out of that? How do we how do we save or bring people or rescue people from um, these uh, these situations? And I think what a story can do is it can bring us into that moment, bring us into that charged moment, and it, it becomes a safe place where we can explore these these themes, where we can think about things like racism white supremacy, religious fundamentalism, fundamentalism which, which are, are a great danger um, to our, our, our nation's fabric. Um, and, and you can explore those in a story and you can take that darkness and bring it into the light. And I, I think that you create an experience for the reader that ultimately, you know, offers some hope and allows them to think about, you know, what we are also going through in our present times. And I wonder about, you know, yours, too. I mean, as as you think about your book and seeing what we've been going through, um, the things that we're dealing with right now as a nation and and the parallels you see with, you know, Nixon and 1974 and um, that that time of turmoil, too. I, I wonder what you think about that. Lynn. I, well, I, I really like what you just said about the, the potential for light in darkness. Um, and and I feel like uh, like in my novel, it, it is about the, in many ways about perversion of religion. Um, in many ways, it is about uh, the way religion in America is often more about America than it than it is about faith. Um, mm -hmm. And 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 those things disturb me. But what I also what tried to do in this novel, and I, and of course one never knows. How well it works, but I also tried to to um, to, uh, to to dramatize how how faith, the power of faith, is in the mystery of faith, not in the dogma that often corrupts it or, or corrupts the people who are attempting to live it. And and so, um, what what I feel when I'm writing a novel is that. Ultimately, we're living in a world of our creation, and we're and we're you know living through people that we make up out of thin air or from our experience, but they're invented. So it, our novels are invented realities. But but I do feel, and I think you feel the same having read your work and and what you just said. But I do feel like we have that obligation, no matter who we create, to populate our books. Is a, I think we have the obligation to to give them an opportunity for redemption. Um, I had a, I had an event last night, and a and a reader asked me, "What is it like to create characters that are unlikable?" And and I thought, "Wow, that's really you know that's a really interesting question." And I and I realized that there are some unlikable characters in this book of mine, um, but but I but I also felt like uh, as the <laughs> you know as the creator of the book, I love the characters, even if mm -hmm. they are um, in many ways. Uh, enacting um a kind of uh even if they're acting out in ways that i might dislike in in in, in the real world if i saw it happening um i still find myself attracted to them in part because i see them as people with with the potential for um for light for redemption for correcting those 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 mistakes they have made and i think as as uh, artists um I think as artists that that we probably ought to try to give 
you know, our characters, those opportunities. I, absolutely. You know, and I just, I remember um, I wrote an essay one time and I described uh, proposing to my wife and, uh, you know, and, and I, I took her up in a hot air balloon, you know, I, I hired a plane to fly past and everything too. And I, I described our, our relationship in rather glowing terms. And I just remember a guy read an early draft of that essay and he said, I don't believe, I don't believe in your relationship, you know? And I realized, you know, that I had romanticized things too much and, wow. you know, that I needed to be honest about some of the difficulties we faced yeah. in that, that first year of marriage. And I, I think that, that if you're, as a storyteller, Lynn, that if you're writing well, you know, your characters are going to have flaws. I don't think those flaws yeah. make them unlikable. You know, even Enoch, who is probably the hardest character, you know, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, he has these other dimensions that make you care about what happens to him. You don't want to see him utterly humiliated um, uh, at, the, at the end of the story, um, you know, and it, it, th that possibility um is there going to be healing between the father and the son in that fractured relationship? That has power and it has drama, not because the characters are idealized, but because they're flawed. And so mm -hmm. I I really like what you said there, because I, I think ultimately mm -hmm. our characters should have these flaws to be fully believable, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to check this question. Um, page and see if there's anything uh, uh let's see well the um i think this was uh the the um question here it says can can we both talk about our formation as writers important influences along the way um which you know we we have, might have a few minutes left here um tom how did you i mean you're you're relatively young as a writer. I mean, you're you're probably still in your forties, and and you've published three novels. How did that happen? Um, yeah, and I only have one more year in in my forties. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> so, but yeah, no, I you know, it, novels take me several years to write, and I wish that I was faster in that whole process. You know, it it, it definitely as a father and as a full time teacher like you, Lynn. Um, it's it's tough finding time to write the books, um, but it's it's one of the things that I love most, that I enjoy most, that I look forward to those morning hours, um, being alone um, and getting the chance to dream at these stories and these characters. Um, you know, so I would say that my formation in part, you know, I knew early on that I wanted to write a novel in my 30s. I had read um, Stephen King's On Writing. And uh, it made the process appear approachable, like maybe even somebody ordinary like me could write a book, could write a novel. But I, I felt like I needed more training. I needed more experience. And so I went back to graduate school. And I really do feel like, you know, one of the best advantages of graduate school, obviously, I've made some wonderful friends there and had some wonderful teachers. But one of the best things that you get is you get time to write. You know, yeah. you can't say, oh, I'm going to take three years off and go write a novel. A lot of people be like, that's, that's pretty crazy. But if, if you say, I'm going to take three years and go to graduate school, they're like, well, great, good for you, go. But really what you're doing is writing a novel. So, you know, so kind of um, to me, that was the essence of part of what my experience was. And I met, had some really great mentors there that helped my development um, along the way. Um, to, to this day, I have friends that um, I meet with um, from graduate school, going to meet with them next week, in fact. Um, and so... Those are part of what helped me develop as a writer. That experience, I think, going back to school was was a wonderful thing. Um, how about you, um, Lynn? What about your own development as a writer? You know, when did you know that you really wanted to do this, and and how did you kind of grow along the way? Uh, kind of a similar story, Tom. Um, I was uh, almost thirty before I did what you did. Went to graduate school. We sounds like we were both older students in, in grad programs. Um, and in that program, um, I, yeah, I came to see myself as a writer for the first time. And, and like you say, I, ha I too had time to write. Um, but I was uh, slower at developing. Um, I was, um, um, I was uh, 50 before I published my first novel. Um, I mean, I got caught up in a couple of things. One was just teaching, the kind of the grind of teaching. 
and I was writing stories though. I was publishing short stories. Um, so I, I started really writing short stories um, and published a bunch of those. Um, and then when I had a good idea for a novel is when, is when I started writing novels, but that didn't come that easily or that quickly. I also spent in my 30s several years writing some mystery novels with my brother under a pseudonym. Hmm. So I learned a lot about novel pacing um, and about the discipline that it takes to to churn out you know a certain number of pages uh, every week or every day um, because when we wrote these mystery novels we we were writing under contract and so we had to turn out a book a year and um, we were working full time so we were you know writing pretty pretty quickly and um, so I, I learned you know I learned a lot in graduate school I learned a lot from writing. Um, under under deadline and under contract. Um, and then I think I also learned quite a bit from teaching writing. Um, I learned a lot about process. And in the end, I think most writers I know would agree that no single process works for everybody. And um, I learned a lot about process from teaching process. And and now I, I think as a, as a writer, I kind of know how I work, what what I what I can't do, what I can do. Um, and with that comes some confidence, but it, it's a long road. I mean, for people out there who want to write the apprenticeship can be, can be a, you know, a, a several or many year process. Um, but in the end, what I've come to is, uh, I, I've come to love the process and treasure the time that I spend writing. Um, it's, a it's a wonderful gift to have that time. And to have that kind of uh, artistic control and um, and energy, so it's something I've come to love. Absolutely, and that's yeah. that's where the magic happens. That's the most fulfilling part of any storytelling is seeing how it comes together and the writing itself. It has to be uh, where it happens. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, I wonder if there's any other questions that that reader that that people out there might have. I, we can't see you uh, that are that have tuned in uh, we can't see how many there are or who you are so uh, the only way we'd know if you have a question is if you would type it in i don't see any more questions um tom do you have any uh or christina um is there any other um anything? it looks like yep. we have a very shy bunch that's okay <laughs> that's okay i just want to say Bye. that you know i treasure the fact that you both do what you do and you do it so well and it's so hard to describe, you. you know, as I listen to these conversations, there's such a value in, in that time spent crafting these words into narratives that we take and create some kind of magic inside of us. I mean, how do you even explain that? It's so, <laughs> it's so intense and profound. So, Thank you both for your work. Thank you for being with us tonight. I hope that I'm going to get to see you both in person at some point in Miami. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, look for, I look forward to that. I can't wait. I look forward to it. Me too. Me too. I would and, love that. <laughs> and I remind everyone watching that you can order copies of the books at Books and Books, and I hope that you will. And I can't wait personally to read both of these books. Um, it has been such an interesting conversation and I think you were both really well matched. So thank you. Thank you. So thank bravo, you. bravo. Yeah, wonderful. And stay safe and well. Again, thank you to everyone watching tonight and we'll see you on the other side as they say, right? Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks so much yeah. to everybody and to Christina yeah. and to thank you, Lynn. I hope you all